Once again, it's good to be here and good that you're here today. You can tell it's a holiday weekend, can't you? But that's okay. Uh, one of the things that, that we did as a fundraiser during our VBS was, was it called Shoes That Grow? Is that what it was? Shoes That Grow. And uh, I think the kids raised about $150 for Shoes That Grow. So that's, I, you know, I'm glad that we have a very giving church, very uh, giving where outreach is concerned and ministry is concerned. And, and uh, we just want to keep that culture right here in, in this church. And we want to pass that to the next generation. And, uh, you know, giving is part of living. It really is. And, and it's not just money. It's, it's other things, too. Just learning to live the life of giving. For God so loved the world that he, he gave. And he still gives, doesn't he? All right, let's get into the word today. Sit, walk, stand. Uh, I didn't get through in the month of June, so I'm taking the month of July. And <laughs> we're going <coughs> to... We're going to get into this. We are, uh, you know, sit, we talked about, had to do with our standing in Christ. We talked about being, being chosen from the foundation of the world, uh, being adopted, and uh, being accepted. That Jesus redeemed us, he forgave us, made known his will to us, and then the Holy Spirit seals us. For the day of redemption. And not only does the Holy Spirit seal us, he is, he is our teacher. He guides us into all truth, and we'll get into some of that as we get into the spiritual armor. Then we talked about walk. In the light of who we are in Christ, it, it tells us how we are to walk with each other. Uh, we're chosen. We're adopted. We're in the same family. We've been accepted by God, and if we've been accepted by God, guess what? We need to accept one another. With all of our differences, uh, it has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with anything like that. It has nothing to do with personality. It has nothing to do with giftedness. We're all accepted in the beloved, and we need to accept one another for who we are. Now, hopefully we're becoming better versions of ourselves as as the Holy Spirit works Christ's redemption in us. But, but we, have to get, we have to forbear with one another as we grow in Christ. And, and it's, it is so neat that, that if we understand this, how we're seated in Christ, it will affect the way that we walk with one another. And then that leads right into, because if we don't get the first two right, listen, we can't do spiritual warfare. If you don't know who you are in Christ, you are without weaponry. Even though you have been redeemed, chosen, all of that, if you're not walking in that, if you're not aware of that, if you're not walking with your brother and sister in that, you are totally without any weaponry to, uh, to do spiritual warfare. And it tells us in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, in conclusion... Be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from Him, and be empowered through your union with Him and in the power of His boundless might. So it tells us where, where everything in our life comes from. It comes from our union with Him, and that's where we draw our strength from. That's where we draw our might from. This is where we learn how to live with each other. This is how we learn how to allow the weapons that God gives us to flow through us. It's, it starts with our union with him and drawing from him. It is not the arm of the flesh. It is not accumulation of spirituality. It, it has to do with drawing our strength from our relationship with Christ. Put on the full armor of God for his precepts are like the splendid army armor of a heavenly, heavily armed soldier. Paul got this revelation as he was in prison. And he was surrounded with Roman soldiers. And, and, and I'm sure as he looked at that weaponry, the Holy Spirit started showing him things about the different pieces of, uh, of armor. Now, we don't have a physical armor. 
Our armor is the precepts of God's word. Our armor is the realities of Christ as they are revealed in us and through us and to us. Those are, this is the armor. It's precepts. It's not some kind of thing that we put on and take off. It is, it's armor. It's precepts. That's our armor. It says, so that you may be able to successfully stand up against all of the schemes, the strategies, and the deceits of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness and heavenly supernatural places. See, we, we miss it when we think that, that, our, that our fight is with people. There's, there is a lot of things happening in our world today, and, and it's coming through people. But listen, your, your, your battle is not with people. It's the forces that drive people. And if you spend your time battling with people, you're going to miss the whole deal. All they are is puppets, manipulated by spiritual forces. And when we get into the contention with people and we do battle with people, guess what? We are puppets being manipulated by the manipulator. Yes, that's, that is so true. So quit fighting with people. Quit contending with people. Lay your prejudices aside. Lay your resentments aside. Lay, lay your unforgiveness aside because those are the things that hurt you. See, when you, when you refuse to forgive, guess what happens? It poisons you more than it does the person that you don't forgive. And you have fallen into one of the schemes of the enemy and he will defeat you because you don't realize where your battle really is. You don't realize where it is. In fact, God has equipped us through our relationship with him and our relationship with other people in a place of victory. The victory is already ours. We are not trying to obtain victory. We are standing in victory. So if when we learn how to contend with the spiritual forces, realizing it's not against flesh and blood, but it's something behind that, we are standing in a place that, that we can become invincible spiritually. We can win the battles that the enemy arrays against us. See, he attacks your mind. He, he attacks us through through the things of the flesh. He attacks us through other people. That, that's his strategies. Satan has no power over you. You are a member of the body of Christ and Satan has no power over you. His whole thing is deception. His whole, things, his whole thing is lies. And listen, Jesus thoroughly defeated him on the cross. He does, you are not a slave. When you become a Christian, you are free. You are redeemed. You are bought and purchased and set free from your slavery. Don't go back and submit yourself through your ignorance to become a slave again. You're, we're to stand in victory. So then he begins, he begins to tell us about the armor. And this is, we're going to get into this day, today. Uh, Therefore put on the, the complete armor of God so that you'll be able to, able to successfully resist and stand against the, your ground in the evil day of danger and having done everything that the crisis demand to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. See, that's your position. Immovable. Immovable. Okay, so he tells us how we do that. He, talk, he begins to talk about what we call the armor. So stand firm and hold your ground having tightened the wide band of truth. Personal integrity, moral courage around your waist. And we're going to stop right there. So the first piece that he talks about is the belt 
of truth. And it's interesting, it's interesting that the belt of truth is mentioned first. Because when a, when a, when a uh, soldier began to put on his armor, he does not start with the belt. In fact, the belt is probably the last thing that the physical that he would put on. But when God talks about it, the very first thing that he talks about is truth. The belt is the central part of the weaponry. It is the center part of the weaponry. And he tells us that that belt is truth. Everything else in this, in this armor flows out of truth. Truth. We hear a lot about truth today. We hear, we hear a lot about what is called uh, absolute truth and relative truth. And absolute truth says, this is absolute truth. Th that is something that is true at all times and in all places. It is something that is always true no matter what the circumstances. It is a fact that cannot be changed. Relative truth is the doctrine that there are no absolute truths, that truth is always relative to some particular frame of reference, such as language or culture. In other words, truth changes. Truth changes. It changes with the culture. It changes with this. And we're seeing a lot of this in our society today. Have you heard this? That all roads lead to God, that all, that all religions really, that lead to the same place, that it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you embrace some form of God, whether you call him Allah or you call him Buddha or you call him Jesus or you call him Jehovah, it's all the same one and it all leads to the same place. It's an inclusive truth. It's a relative truth. Now, and here's, here's a funny thing is that, that people who believe in relative truth will say this. There is no such thing as absolute truth. And all you got to do is ask the question. Is it absolutely true that there is no absolute truth? It's a self-defeating argument. There are absolute truths. There are truths that do not change no matter what the circumstance in all times and in all places. It, it, it's true no matter what. It, it's, just, it's just a truth. See, it's true right now that, that outside it's 81 degrees. That's absolutely true according to my watch right here. It's absolutely true that it's 81 degrees. So that's true in all places at all times? Yes. It's true that at Batesville, Arkansas, right here, it's 81 degrees. No matter where you're looking at it from Japan or anywhere else, it's absolutely true that it's 81 degrees right here. There are absolute truths. Here's an absolute truth. There is a God. That's absolutely true. Well, it's only God if you believe. No. It's absolutely true that there is a God. There, it's absolutely true that Daniel Green is sitting right there. That is, that is an absolute truth. Unless he gets up and moves, he's sitting right there. That's absolutely true. So there are absolute truths and, and relative truths. They get all in all this relativism. And, and what it does, it blurs the, the lines. And this is one of the tactics that the enemy uses to deceive people, to deceive people. So the belt is the belt of truth. And listen, every other piece of armor depends on this belt of truth. <clears throat> now the belt of truth was the last thing that was put on, but it's the first thing where our spiritual equipment is concerned. It's interesting that in the Roman, in the Roman armor, uh, the belt of truth held everything else in place. The breastplate, and we'll talk about the breastplate next week. The breastplate was kind of a two-sided thing, sheets of metal, and uh, it had rings at the top. It was later called a coat of mail. And it, it went from the neck to the knee. 
And the very thing that, that fastened that thing together was the belt. On that belt, on one side, was a clip that when the soldier was not using his sword, that that sword hung on that clip. On the other side of that piece of, uh, of the belt was another clip that when the soldier was not using his shield, that it hung on that, it rested on that clip. Now that tells us something. The sword, the Bible says, is the word of God. And the shield is faith. And what does faith rest on? How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, real faith comes from truth. The sword of the spirit, which is the reign of God, and we'll get into that later, which is the spoken word of God, the empowered word of God, the revealed word of God, where does it come from? It comes from truth. Truth is the centerpiece of the, of the Roman's armor. If he, did not have, if he did not have the belt of truth around him, the breastplate would come off. Uh, he would not have a place for his sword and his shield when he was doing battle. So this is, this is a primary thing. It is very, very uh, necessary. It, it's, and, and it's kind of interesting that the, the, the armor starts with truth and it ends with truth. It starts with truth and it ends with the word. So every piece of armor is revealed through truth. The helmet, the helmet of salvation, the shoes of peace, all is a revelation of a precept or a truth of God. Okay, so let's look at some, some truth scriptures. We got several that we're going to look at today, uh, and, and this kind of gives us some insight into tr what truth is, uh, where it comes from, what it does in our lives. The first one is in uh, John 1, chapter 14. And, and I love the way it starts in 1. In the beginning uh, was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word, Christ, became flesh and lived among us, and we actually saw his glory. Glory as belongs to the, to the one and only, only begotten Son of the Father, the Son who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, who is full of grace and what? Truth. Absolutely free from deception. Hey, that's a good attribute of truth. It's absolutely free of deception. And who, who is that truth? Who was full of truth? Jesus was full of truth. He was truth. John testified repeatedly about him and has cried out, testifying officially for the record with validity and relevance. This is he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I and has priority over me for he existed before me. For out of his fullness, the superabundance of his grace and what? Truth. We have all received grace upon grace, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, favor upon favor, and, and gift heaped upon gift. For the law was given through Moses, but grace, the unearned, undeserved favor of God, and what? Truth came through Jesus Christ. So wh wh what is the source of truth? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God the Father. But it, but it came into the world through Jesus Christ. Now, we saw what the law brought. It didn't bring, I mean, there was grace and there was truth. But listen, favor and truth came through Jesus. John chapter 4, verse 24. It says, God is a spirit, the source of life, yet invisible to mankind. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in what? Truth. Where does truth come from? It's revealed through Jesus Christ. So who is the source of our worship? Who is the object of our worship? Jesus Christ, whom truth came from. So we worship him in spirit and in what? Truth. 
We worship him within the context of truth. I am amazed how Jesus is being reinvented in the world today. How that there are certain things that people are affirming that is totally against the word of God and they're saying, well, the Jesus that I worship would never judge anybody. The Jesus that I worship would allow this and allow that when totally it's against the word of God. They are reinventing an image of Jesus that is not really Jesus. Are you out there? It's so true. How do we know who Jesus is? Through the word of God, through truth. We look into the word of God because the words of God are true. Jesus is the word, and the word is Jesus. So grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I love John 8, 32. And you will know the truth regarding salvation, and the truth will set you free from the penalty of sin. Not only from the penalty of sin, it'll just set you free in general. The truth liberates us. The truth sets us free. That is the gospel. The gospel is God's freedom for mankind. Man, because of his nature, became a slave under the law. Because we could not keep the law. We could not, we could not meet the requirements of the law. But Jesus came and met the requirements of the law and then paid our penalty and set us free. And when we know that truth, guess what? We have been set free by Jesus. That is a quality of the truth. That's part of our armor, our freedom. There are so many Christians today that are bringing themselves back under bondage they get under bondage, got to keep the law, got to keep the law. This was prevalent during this time. Listen, we should do the things that are in the law by the nature of who we are in Christ. You know, we, we talked about our, our to, to, we are seated in Christ, we are in a relationship with Christ, and we are in a relationship with one another. Well, if I love and I'm in a relationship with Christ in the body of Christ, I'm not going to defraud my brother and sister. I'm going to honor God. Remember, you know, it, talk, it talks about uh, put no other gods before me. Don't make graven images. Well, you know, if I love God, I, I won't do those things because of my love for God. And if I love you as the body of Christ, I am not going to do the other things that are in the Ten Commandments that would hurt you or bring harm to you. I'm going to honor my father and mother. I'm, go, I'm not going to bear false witness. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to do those things. But I don't do that so that I can earn something because I can't earn anything. I do that because of the love of God. It's, it, it's the truth of the love of God. It's the, it's the liberty that we have been given in Christ. Amen. <laughs> John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God. Hey, here's an absolute truth. You ready for this one? I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, there are Christians who do not believe that. There are Christians that say, well, you know, he was a pretty good guy. He's probably going to get to heaven. There's going to be a lot of pretty good guys that didn't accept Jesus that are not saved because we're not good enough to get to heaven. None of us, okay? So we, we've set up this, this scale of, you know, good and bad, and, you know, and good people go to heaven and bad people don't. Well, in God's scale, we were all bad. I know this is exciting. <laughs> he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
It's by God's grace, by God's love, by God's drawing and wooing us that we come into a relationship with him. And listen, there is liberty in that. And there's truth in that. And when the devil comes at you and says, you're not worthy, guess what? He's right. He's right. You're not worthy. But we're not saved because we're worthy. So turn around and say, devil, it is written. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now go smoke that. That's how you do spiritual warfare. That's how you do spiritual warfare. It begins with a revelation of the truth. It begins with the revelation of the truth. John 16, 13. <clears throat> Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. But when he, and what does it call him? The Spirit of Truth. I've heard people say, the Holy Spirit told me to do such and such. And it's a total contradiction of what the Bible says. Is the Holy Spirit going to contradict the Word of God? Never. Never, ever, ever. Why? Because he is the Spirit of truth. Jesus said one time, he says, you know what? I only say what the Father says. And I only do what the Father does. And the Holy Spirit is the same way. They are in unity together in truth. And they don't contradict one another. And this, and this calls him the spirit of truth. He said when he comes, this is one of the Holy Spirit's jobs for the believer. He will guide you into all the truth, full and complete truth. How's he going to do that? Through the belt of truth. Which is what? The Bible. The belt of truth is the Bible. The Bible is God's word. The Bible is God's truth. And the Holy Spirit is going to use the Bible to guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but he will speak whatever he hears from the Father, the message regarding the Son, and he will disclose to you what is to come in the future. Thank God. You know, the Holy Spirit will even guide you and, and give you direction into the future. He will direct your future. He will, he will lead us in, into a... a uh, uh, understanding of the future. Um, the book of Revelation came by the Spirit of God. Our men's uh, Bible group has been studying. The, are y'all still studying the book of Revelation? Oh, he, in Ecclesiastes now. He's, they finished the book of Revelation. That was, a, that was a manifestation of the Spirit. The Spirit revealed that to, to John. And, and so... He will even talk to us about the future. John 17, 17. We got two more verses and here's one of the works of truth. Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Set them apart for your purposes. Make them holy. Your word is truth. Sanctify. That means to set apart for purpose and to make holy. That's, that's one of the works of the Spirit. That's one of the works of truth is that it sets us apart for a purpose. Now, when we come to Christ, we're full of our own ideals of what our purpose is. I did not want to be a pastor. When I was in school, I, I, I wanted to be a coach. I wanted, to, I, I wanted to be a whole bunch of things. I couldn't decide what I was wanting to be. I just, you know, boy, that looks good. I think I'll do that. I, then, and, and preacher never came into the equation, okay? When I, when I became a Christian, all of a sudden something began to work on the inside of me that afterwards I looked back and it had been working all along, even as a kid. We used to get the clothes hamper out and, and, and I'd set my brother and sister down and I'd preach to them. I don't know what I said, probably wasn't much, but, but, but we played church. But after I got saved, that began to work in me. It began to work in me, and it became stronger and stronger and stronger. What was that? That was the Holy Spirit bringing me into to purpose, 
As I began to learn the truths of God, I began to see certain things and the Holy Spirit began to, to direct me towards God pur God's purpose for my life. And I'm so glad I found out what my purpose was. This has been the most fulfilling thing that I've ever done in my life. I'm glad I'm a pastor. That was my purpose. Well, how does that come about? By God, through the Holy Spirit, through the Word, setting me apart for purpose. Now, he doesn't call everybody to preach, but he calls everybody for a purpose. Every one of us has a purpose, and, we, and the Holy Spirit is at work in you to direct you in that purpose. Some of you have a heart for mission. Some of you have a heart for, for the hurting. Some of you have different hearts for different things. Some of you, want just, you just have a heart to serve. Some of you have a heart to teach. Some of you don't know what you're supposed to do. But the Holy Spirit's at work trying to bring you into that purpose. Then Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 says this. It says, but speaking the truth in love, in all things, both our speech and our lives expressing his truth, let us grow up in all things into him, following his example, who is the head, Christ. And it says as we do what? As we speak the truth in love. In all things, both in our speech and in our actions, in our love, how we love one another. It says we do what? We grow up into him. It's the pursuit of truth. Truth is the strongest weapon that we have. Without the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit will never come into play. Faith will never come into play. Righteousness will never come into play. Truth will never come into play. We will be naked where it comes to spiritual warfare. It begins with truth. We are a church of the word. We are a church of the precepts of God. We want to build a foundation under you so that the Holy Spirit can work in your life to bring you where he wants to be. It was unfortunate. I was raised in a church that did not put an emphasis on the word of God. It was a church, wasn't a bad church, but we didn't learn precepts. We didn't learn principles. We, we heard some truth but it wasn't a priority. It was more about ritual and love, which love is a good thing, but love needs to be grounded in truth. Everything needs to be grounded in the truth of God's word. Amen? There's the belt of truth. There's the belt of truth. It's the, it's the central part of the armor of God. Let's stand. Father, thank you. We're going to sing another song in worship. If you're here today, you need to make Jesus Lord. There'll be people here to pray with you. If you have other, I know we've already done one prayer call, but, but you know, if the Holy Spirit is ministering something to you and you need prayer about that, come and let them pray with you. But the rest of us, let's just worship our God.